Hello, and welcome to the Camden Public Libraries program, Friday Explorations Read Aloud. My name is Joseph Cote, and I will be your host today. I think the most challenging course of my high school career was an introduction to philosophy. Leading our journey uh, was the mediocre Mr. Mortensen, whose head seemed to be in the clouds in the cafeteria, as well as in the clouds in the classroom. In a striking attempt to immediately capture the attention of the class, the first seven words that shot like an arrow from his pursed lips were, you aren't who you think you are. Well, at that age, in what we thought the pressure cooker of our young lives, most of us were struggling with who we were and not quite reaching toward who we weren't yet. We bewildered bunglers in life at age 17 were introduced to our first assignment, the opening chapter from a book published in 1902 called Human Nature and the Social Order, written by a guru named Charles Cooley. Yes, I still have the book to this day. And not for the messages of Mr. Cooley, but for the hilarious messages written on the blank pages, front and back, by pseudo-witty fellow students not quite ready for Mr. Cooley. I went back to the book yesterday to refresh my memory. I happily share with you, briefly, a tidbit or two of the wisdom of Mr. Cooley as espoused by Mr. Mortensen in 1971 spring to 12 high school honors seniors, much more focused on getting out into the world. Mr. Cooley introduces the idea of a looking glass self. Self, as defined in this context, is what you refer to when you say, I. So far, so good. Considering how personal the self seems, it would make sense to assume that each individual develops their own sense of self and who they are with their thoughts and emotions. Logical. This mentality could be described as, I am who I think I am. According to the theory of the looking glass self, this is not the case. The looking glass self is defined by our perceptions of what others think of us. This would be more like, I am who I think you think I am. Therefore, what is most important when developing a sense of self is not what we think of ourselves, but what we assume others think of us. Who, heavy man. <laughs> well, at least the seeds were planted. We did get out into the world which proved to be a more overwhelming task than we anticipated, and for a differing number of years kept wondering, who am I? The three words that thrill psychotherapists. Today's book, In the Spotlight, brought me back to the classroom of Mr. Mortensen. May he rest in peace. The key characters in the book have fascinating and differing backstories of early life experiences. All have more intriguing adult stories before they circuitously find themselves together, separated, together again, 
in the pressure cooker of a world of international espionage in the increasingly frightening stages of World War II. And the single most unlikely yet high profile den mother, often at the center of the great espionage story of the era from Paris to Lisbon and especially to Casablanca, was a child of poverty born in St. Louis, Missouri in 1906. Determined and talented young woman she was, it was in 1925 at age 19 that she followed her dreams, turned her back on American racism and magically, dramatically, and memorably became the ultimate toast of the Parisian entertainment world to become the highest paid female performer in Europe. And then, and then when Hitler and the Nazi machine bullied its way into Paris in April of 1940, all, quote, Negroes and Jewish performers were banned from the stage. Instead of returning to America, Josephine Baker vowed to stay and to fight the Nazi evil. It was then, overnight, that the St. Louis girl with no shoes to wear to school went from European performer to resistance spy. It was then when the phrase, I am who you think I am, became her life's single script and her flashy and fabulous talents on the European stages and before the Allied troops far and wide became her cover. Today's book in the spotlight is Agent Josephine, American Beauty, French Hero, British Spy. Written by Damien Lewis and published a few short months ago in 2022, by the Hatchet Book Group. But before exploring the story told, let's consider some facts about the author. Damien Lewis, not to be confused with the British actor on American television, Damien Lewis is an award-winning best-selling author whose books have been translated into over 40 languages worldwide. Lewis spent 20 years reporting from war, disaster, and conflict zones for the BBC and other global news organizations across Africa, South America, the Middle East, and the Far East. His more than 20 books include World War II classics, Churchill's Secret Warriors, or Hunting the Nazi Bomb, SAS Ghost Patrol, SAS Italian Job, and SAS Band of Brothers. I should add here that SAS equals America's version CIA. A dozen of his books have been made into movies and drama series and have been adapted at plays for the stage. Lewis is a founder member of the Irish Film and Television Agency, IFTA, and the Frontline Club. He is a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society and the Winston Churchill Memorial Trust. He is a member of the Society of Authors, the National Union of Journalists, the Directors Guild of Great Britain, the Victory Services Club, the Royal Overseas League, and the 21 SAS Artists Rifles Clubhouse. 
The New York Times has called his work extraordinary. Newsweek calls it heartening. The Sunday Times, a tale of bravery against desperate odds. And The Economist, a triumph. Josephine Baker, Agent Josephine. American beauty, French hero, British spy. Drawing on a plethora of new historical material and rigorous research over 10 years, including previously undisclosed letters and journals, 51 pages of bibliography, sources, and footnotes, Damien Lewis upends the conventional story of Josephine Baker, explaining why she fully deserves her unique place in the Allied victories of World War II. On August 23rd, 2021, French news flashes lit the country from Paris to Marseille and from the Pyrenees to the French Alps. Legendary black entertainer Josephine Baker is set to become the first black woman to have her remains buried in the Pantheon Monument in Paris, one of the highest honors in France. French President Emmanuel Macron made the announcement, writing that Baker, quote, held high the motto of the French Republic. In a statement released the same day, the Elysee Palace wrote that Baker was the embodiment of the French spirit, though she was born American. Quoting, world-renowned music hall artist, committed to the resistance, tireless anti-racist activist. She was involved in all the fights that bring together citizens of goodwill. In France, and around the world, the palace wrote. She was honored at the monument on November 30th of last year, just a few months ago. Baker, who died in 1975, became the first black woman to be buried at the monument, joining just five other women, French Holocaust survivor Simone Weil, scientist Marie Curie, French resistance fighter Jean-Vivre de Gaulle, Anton Noir, and Germaine Tillion and Sophie Bethelot, the wife of a famous chemist who was buried along with her husband. In my humble opinion, Agent Josephine is a spy novel like no other. First, it's as historically accurate a spy story as one can imagine. But foremost, it's the true story of World War II Allied espionage that stars the most unlikely character set on lifting the spirits of thousands of troops, quote, always mixed, whites and Negroes side by side with my many local Arab friends, she insisted, especially in Morocco. With determination to entertain even when near death's door in Casablanca while preparing for the largest ever allied invasion of North Africa. On a personal note, I've always been a fan in 1974, I arrived in St. Louis to begin graduate work at Washington University in the near suburb of University City, once home to Middle America's most spirited African-American jazz and blues neighborhoods in Chestnut Alley. The vibrant area was all gone as the result of extensive urban renewal, but I did find a revitalized rendition of the Josephine Baker Jazz and Blues Club on Pope Avenue in Penrose, closer to the Mississippi River that inspired much of the music of the era. It wasn't Paris, but 
It was sure the music of Josephine Baker. Later in 1986, I relished a great evening at the newly opened Chez Josephine on West 42nd Street along Theater Row. A tribute to legendary entertainer Josephine Baker, founded in that year by Jean-Claude Baker, no relation, Chez Josephine offers a French-American menu and live piano music in an intimate Parisian setting. This landmark jewel is inviting and romantic with its blue tin ceiling, red velvet walls, and cavalcade of chandelier that light up vintage portraits of La Baker. The New York Times enthused about the restaurant and club with the words, where the legend of Josephine Baker lives on. Cafe Josephine in Paris is located at 1-3 Place des Deux Ecus in the first arrondissement, just in case you're planning a visit. I admire and respect the life accomplishments of Josephine Baker, and I loved the book. Let us begin to tell this tale, a most incredible tale it is. <clears throat> the author begins more in establishing the unfolding of the enormous espionage world in Europe uh, and then in North Africa, especially as the Nazi regime uh, has their eye on France and on Paris. So I'm going to start by reading from the preface, just some basic information that I think is interesting. And then I'm going to start at the very beginning of the book, uh, which also intermixes some things about her. There's so many incredible tales to tell as she swooped through airports around Europe with 28 suitcases and a, a trained tiger and birds and everything. All in white she was with furs and fabulous getting autographs and carrying some of the most incredible bits of espionage needed by Britain, America and the rest of the allies. Incredible stories. Let me just read you what the author says in the preface. Uh, he came upon this information and uh, was fascinated by it, that Josephine Baker was uh, a member of the top echelon of British spy uh, units, as well as the CIA. And he says, um, I became captivated by the story embodied in Chateau de Milan. This was Josephine Baker's small castle uh, on the outskirts of Paris, where she escaped to on many occasions. And it became the center uh, when uh, Hitler was approaching Paris, everything moved to her little castle. As I pondered it, I found myself wrestling with a conundrum. How was it that a woman of such global renown could have ended up performing some sort of gray role serving as a spy in the Second World War? Surely her very notoriety and fame militated against any such clandestine role. And surely a woman of such unique and distinctive celebrity would have been the least likely candidate ever to spy for France or for any of the allies. And so, as one tends to do, I began to dig. The story that emerged was simultaneously mysterious, tantalizing, and sensational. Josephine Baker had been born into poverty in St. Louis, Missouri in the American Midwest, a city that hugs the banks of the sluggish, meandering Mississippi River. She had left as soon as she was able, making her way to New York, seeking the limelight of the Broadway stage. But by her own account, prejudice, America was still prone to racial segregation and the so-called Jim Crow laws, held her back. In 1925, she had sailed for France, seeking to escape all of that, and very quickly she had captured the hearts of Parisians. 
she found France to be largely free of prejudice. And as with wider Europe, at least in comparison to what she had experienced in the USA. Paris was a city that embraced her, that she fell in love with and made her home. But then had come the rise of Nazi Germany. Josephine, who told many versions of her rags to riches tale and life story, seemed to have little, seemed to have little fixed immutable past or wider history. But by the late 1930s, she had become transfixed by a burning hunger to fight and to defeat the threat emanating from Berlin. To her, the rise of Hitler, Goring, and Eichmann, plus the Fuhrer's other henchmen, threatened all that she had come to believe in and all that she had held dear. If the forces of Nazi Germany invaded, she would once again be forced to flee from prejudice and hatred. But where could she go? If the entire world was to be engulfed in the struggle for freedom, as seemed inevitable, where would she run to next? Or should she choose instead to stay and fight? In truth, there was little debate in Josephine's mind. She had always been a fighter, ever since she had packed her bags and left St. Louis with little or no idea how she would make it in the world. She resolved that whatever the cost, whatever it might entail, she would stay and embrace the struggle. Of course, she had little idea what form the fight might take, and even less sense of how a Black woman of such global renown could possibly play a role. That was until she was approached by a French intelligence agent called Captain Jacques Abti, though he was not using his real name at the time. Abti and his bosses at the Deuxième Bureau, the CIA of Paris, an arm of what would be the equivalent of Britain's secret intelligence service, SIS, along with the CIA in America, had a very clear sense of how Josephine might help fight the war of the shadows. It was exactly because she was so famous, instantly recognizable and universally loved, at least outside of Nazi circles, that she could serve such a potent role. Now let's leave that information, start with chapter one and see how that information folds into the information of Captain Abti. Chapter one is called A Traitor Unmasked. As his chauffeur nosed the sleek black Rolls Royce through the dawn streets of Paris, Wilfred Biffy Dunderdale had little inkling that his actions over the coming months would have such immense historic significance, or that he would end up serving as a role model for the world's most famous fictional secret agent, 007, James Bond. As the chief of Britain's secret intelligence service, SIS, also known as MI6 in France, it was almost inevitable that Dunderdale and Bond's creator, Ian Fleming, would serve together in the espionage capitals of the world. Indeed, they would first do so in Paris, just as the city was poised to fall to Nazi Germany's onslaught. The two men had a great deal in common. Both were scions of wealthy Scottish dynasties. Both would join Boodles, the centuries old London club, steeped in diplomacy and espionage, where they would rub shoulders with the likes of Winston Churchill. Both were Royal Naval Commanders by profession, which served as their entry point into the world of espionage. Clichéd though it might sound, both were also drawn to fast cars and fast wine, and they were destined to become firm friends. With swept back dark hair, eyes creased with laughter lines, and a deep dimple in his chin, 
Dunderdale was blessed with boyish, almost mischievous, good looks. Charming, suave, impeccably dressed, his father was a shipping magnate, and Dunderdale was of independent means. He was often to be seen wearing gold Cartier cufflinks, a long ebony cigarette holder clamped between his teeth, the same as favored by the fictional Bond, and with a bottle of vintage champagne never far from hand. Yet beneath the chummy, clubbable, debonair look, this Paris spy bastard was no soft touch, as the level expression behind his gaze hinted at. Belying his diminutive stature, Dunderdale stood five feet six inches tall. He was a tough and resolute foe, not to mention loyal to a fault. He had earned the singular nickname Biffy due to his prowess in boxing, and he was known to have something of a cutthroat piratical streak. Beneath its immaculate and sumptuous exterior, his Rolls Royce was no pushover either. It was fitted with concealed bulletproof steel plates and glass. A hugely likable, if eccentric and unconventional character, Dunderdale was determined to do whatever it took to get the job done. And no matter who he might rub up the wrong way. His actions that spring, 1938 morning, would epitomize that spirit. In the Irish capital, Dublin, British intelligent agents had stumbled upon what increasingly looked to be the work of France's greatest pre-war traitor. That man's identity was yet to be unmasked, but right now, Dunderdale had on his person evidence of treachery and perfidy most foul, and at such a level that all of France was threatened, not to mention her foremost ally, Great Britain. As Dunderdale appreciated, such loyal disloyalty could not go unchallenged. The betrayer needed to be hunted down before any further harm might be wrought. The world teetered on the brink of war. Much that the politicians might deny it, those fighting the war in the shadows, the war of the secret services, knew what was coming. Adolf Hitler was well bent on avenging what he saw as the injustices heaped upon Germany following the First World War and of winning global domination under the credo of Nazism, of forging his dark kingdom, his Third Reich. And if he succeeded, as Dunderdale and his colleagues well knew, freedom would die in darkness. At first glance, Dunderdale and his chauffeur, Paul Kalesso, a gnarled giant of a Ukrainian, were the most unlikely of pairings. But ever since Dunderdale's youthful recruitment into the SIS, the two had been inseparable, firm friends, loyal unto death. Kalesso, a former cavalry officer, had fought at Verdun, in the Great War, in defense of France, and Dunderdale had convinced him not to return home at war's end. Instead, he had persuaded Kalesso that he would be far better off running the Hotel de Havre at 37 Boulevard Montparnasse in Paris, which was operated as an SIS safe house, being used to harbor agents, cash, and espionage equipment. Kalesso doubled as Dunderdale's driver, just as he was doing today. Quietly, smoothly, he nosed the gleaming rolls into a vacant parking lot spot in Paris's seventh arrondissement and killed the engine. <laughs> to their front, cloaked in the shadows of that early morning in spring, lay the Avenue de Tourville, headquarters of the Deuxième Bureau, France's counter-espionage service. Though woefully understaffed, the handful of men beavering away beneath this ancient domed edifice were some of the best spy hunters in the business, past masters at turning the enemy's strategies, resources, and agents back against them. 
If only they had a smidgen more money and agents and clout, they would be unbeatable. But backing from the political hierarchy was woefully lacking, as Paris fervently, blindly, gambled that France wouldn't be catapulted into another war with the old enemy. In short, too many heads were buried too firmly in the sand. Inside the Avenue de Tourville uh, headquarters, Dunderdale's deuxième bureau colleagues were on tender hooks. Little could or ever would be said over open phone lines. Paris, indeed, all of France, was awash with German agents, as the ABWA, Nazi Germany's much expanded intelligence service, sought to overwhelm and subvert her enemies. <coughs> Pardon. Pardonnez-moi. Berlin had watchers and listeners everywhere. Germany's om omnipresent Forkschengamst, forgive me, my German friends, the ultra-secret telephone, mail, and radio intercept and code-breaking service had spread its tentacles across the length and breadth of Germany as the Nazi elite turned that nation into a terrifying police state, one in which all dissent was crushed. With a staff numbering several thousand, the Forschungsam was extended its region to France and Britain, for the sea was no expedi exped impediment to radio interception. As for the Abwer, so brazen had their agents become, they were openly taking telephone calls at the German embassy in Paris from services and sources across France knowing that the Deuxième Bureau was bound to be listening. It was almost as if Germany's intelligence service was challenging Paris, the French authorities, to challenge them to do something. To indulge in an act of provocation, one that could be used as justification for ever greater belligerence, provoking an even more vitriolic tide of propaganda from Joseph Goebbels, right minister of public enlightenment and propaganda, plus an ever more vigorous beating of the drums of war. Dunderdale's colleagues at the Dizium Bureau manned the German desk, though they were but a paltry few. Their chief, Commander Paul Peoy, was exactly what Dunderdale would expect from such a man in such a position. A champion fencer, Peoul had been schooled at Sincere, the foremost French military academy, the equivalent of Britain's Sandhurst or America's West Point. After service in the North African colonies, chiefly Algeria, he had fully intended to follow a traditional soldier's career. His posting to the Dersian Bureau had come completely from out of the blue, but true to form. A rigorous man of duty, he had made the cat and mouse game of counterespionage very much his own. Tall, slender, dark haired, with angular, almost emaciated features, Paiol had proved a demanding boss, one keen to forge ever closer links with the Dizian Bureau's foremost ally, the Secret Intelligence Service. To him, Dunderdale had found a committed opponent to the rise of Nazi Germany, an enthusiastic Anglophile and an archetypical patriotic Frenchman. By contrast, Peol's deputy and Dunderdale's other key partner in this war in the shadows were exactly cut from the same cloth, or so first appearances might suggest. Captain Maurice Leonard Apti, known to all as Jacques, was blonde with pale blue eyes and classic Nordic good looks, and he was as much at home speaking German as French. Born and brought up in the Alsace region on France's eastern border with Germany, in lands which historically were claimed as much by Berlin as by Paris, Abti 
readily admitted that their family name was very likely of German origin. His family was steeped in German culture as much as it was of France. Prior to being recruited into the Deuxième Bureau, he had graduated from the French Center for Advanced Germanic Studies in Strasbourg, becoming ever more immersed in the German nation's language and values. But in fact, it was his very Germanness that made him such an asset. Abte would talk like the enemy, think like the enemy, and be looked like the archetypical Nazi foe. Perhaps in an effort to undercut his order, disciplined Germanic side, there was something of the rebel, the spirited maverick in Abte, just as there was in Dunderdale. As the latter liked to cruise the streets of Paris in the bulletproof Rolls Royce, so the former was in the habit of commuting to work not on the Paris metro, nor even by bicycle, but paddling a kayak on the gray-green waters of the Seine, which weaves its way through the heart of Paris with a meandering, looping ease. From early spring to the darkest days of winter, kayak time proved decompression time, a precious hour away from the desk and the mind-bending intrigues of work. Living in the Van Vez suburb of Paris, the six-kilometer paddle took Abte beneath the Bay and Court and Alma bridges, whereupon he would tie up his canoe and make the remainder of the commute on foot. Quote, once on the water, I forgot about spies, suspects, reports, intelligence, anonymous letters, Abte would write, or most usually he would. In the coming weeks, his thoughts would keep drifting to the very betrayal that Dunderdale was in the process of uncovering. Late the previous evening, Dunderdale had telephoned unexpectedly, keeping communication to the absolute minimum. Might he call around at the Deuxième Bureau's office first thing the following morning, he had asked. Before agreeing to a meeting, the staff on the German desk had asked the obvious question. Was the matter as serious as it seemed to be? It's serious, Dunderdale had confirmed simply. Nothing further needed to be said. Dunderdale's reputation went before him. Brought up and schooled in Odessa, Ukraine, from where his father ran the family shipping business, his entry into the world of espionage had begun spectacularly, if somewhat prematurely. At age 18, he had joined the Royal Navy, being mentioned in dispatches twice for individual acts of bravery towards the end of the First World War. He had then volunteered for an unusually hazardous mission, one aimed at discovering if the communists who were even then seizing power in Paris and Russia, had got their hands on some particularly sophisticated weaponry. At the height of the war, the American armaments firm, the Electric Boat Company, today part of General Dynamics Corporation, had sold Russia a dozen partially assembled mini submarines. Russia then being an ally, as far as anyone knew, the mini-subs were still in Odessa, the Black Sea port city to where they had been shipped. Dunderdale spoke fluent Russian and had only recently graduated from school in Odessa. Plus, for some reason, he still had his school uniform with him. Packed in a trunk and stowed away aboard the Royal Navy vessel on which he served. Put ashore, dressed as an Odessa schoolboy, he made for his former housemaster's home, seeking to discover what exactly had happened to those diminutive submarines. What on earth are you doing here, Dunderdale? His former housemaster greeted him with undisguised incredulity. Having explained his unlikely mission, the housemaster banished the schoolboy spy to the attic, for his discovery would spell trouble. He happened to have a relative who worked in the Odessa yacht, uh, docks, he explained, from whom he was sure to discover the fate of those mini-subs. 
Dunderdale, meanwhile, was to remain hidden at all times. Your Latin was always behind, the housemaster scolded as he banished his former pupil to the room beneath the eaves. You can work up there to improve it. The very next day, the housemaster had the answer to Dunderdale's quest, and the teenage agent left his hideout and made his prearranged pickup with the Royal Navy. Mission accomplished, or almost. It was decided that those mini-subs could not be left in communist hands. They were subsequently sabotaged in a dramatic mission of underwater daring do, in which Dunderdale again played a key role. For each extraordinary bouts of terrorism, in June 1922, Dunderdale would earn an MBE, the most excellent order of the British Empire, a chivalric order. He was just 21 years old. <laughs> Recruited into the SIS, what else was anyone to do with him? A string of similarly colorful adventures followed him before Dunderdale earned his Paris posting. A born secret agent. A good decade later, he was resolutely stalking that city street, intent on defeating those enemies who plot and scheme in the shadows. Exiting his Rolls Royce, Dunderdale stepped into an ancient clanging lift with a sliding wire door which spirited him into the bowels of the Avenue de Tourville headquarters, set directly beneath the great dome of the Church of Les Invalides. Prior to the Eiffel Tower being built, this was the highest building in all Paris, and it houses Napoleon Bonaparte's tomb. There, deep in the catacombs, a small, dark iron door barred the way. To be admitted, Dunderdale had first to ring a bell set into the centuries-old stonework before announcing his name and purpose into a wire mesh-covered peephole. Only when the doorkeeper was fully satisfied as to his identity was he permitted entry. The closely guarded domain of French counterespionage exuded spycraft, plus a certain respect and esteem for one's adversary, in this case, chiefly the German Abwehr. On one wall was displayed the motto of the German intelligence service from the First World War. De nach intendeist est ein Herrendeinst. The intelligence service is a service of gentlemen. In other words, there was a highly call, higher calling, and only those with courage and an unbreakable moral fortitude need apply. According to Payol, honor was critical in such a seemingly amoral profession. We need to be of all of the most rigorous, for we were dealing with terrible, amb ambiguous, frightening, and sometimes sordid situations, he said. Serving as an intelligent officer required very different qualities than those of a regular soldier. As Payol had learned, you had to throw off the military straitjacket. Flexibility and lateral thinking were key. You had to learn the rules in order to break the rules before rewriting the rules. Somewhat unexpectedly, Pelorl had found this suited him down to the ground, and it was something that likewise seemed to come naturally to his colleague, Jacques Abti. Once admitted into Pelorl's lair, Dunderdale looked from a locked leather briefcase, a thick envelope addressed in French to a Dublin mailbox. Tipped off by the FBI, MI5, Britain's Domestic Intelligence Service, Ireland was seen as domestic or home territory, had learned that the Dublin post office box served as a dead letter drop for the Abwer, an anonymous and supposedly untraceable address in a neutral country to which could be sent sensitive information. MI5 had set up surveillance and intercepted this and a previous missive before they reached German hands. What had led the FBI to the innocent looking post office box was in itself one hell of a tale concerning a concerted 
effort by Berlin to establish a spy ring deep inside the USA. But that was firmly FBI business. The first envelope had it steamed open and found to contain a single brief page, an alert as when to the next substantive cache of documents would arrive from France. It had been resealed and returned to the post office box so as not to arouse suspicion. But the present parcel now being delivered by Dunderdale was an entirely different matter. It was stuffed thick with papers. With great care, Pelol and Abdi proceeded to steam open the envelope and photograph the contents, which concerned certain details of the French naval fleet stationed in the Mediterranean. The pages looked as if they had been torn from a school exercise book, and the intelligence they contained was handwritten, with only an A for a signature. It provided precious little to go on as to the identity of the traitor. Frustratingly, the postmark was from a post office in Paris, not so far distant from the Deuxième Bureau's Avenue de Tourville headquarters. Peyrol ordered the envelope resealed, after which it was be dispatched to its intended destination post haste. Admittedly, they would be delivering valuable intelligence into the hands of the enemy, the Abwar. At that time, the modern French fleet was the fourth most powerful in the world. After Great Britain, the US and Japan, if war was coming, those French warships were bound to play a key role in the defense of Western Europe. But that was a price Balol, Balol deemed worth paying to keep the traitor active and to buy time to hunt, trace, and trap him. Payol's team rushed into action. At the headquarters of the French Admiralty, the naval intelligence staff were flabbergasted at the details the handwritten notes revealed. The first line read, the Mediterranean fleet can set sail in 24 hours. The nation's warships had indeed been placed on extremely high state of readiness, but only a few score French naval officers were aware of this. They narrowed the field of suspects a little. A foremost expert was asked to analyze the informant's handwriting. He concluded that the mystery author, A, was a young man aged about 30, thick set and powerfully built, but who lacked both a high degree of education and a strong personality. Peol and Abti crunched the numbers looking for a naval officer who fit the description and whose surname began with A. That narrowed the field a little more, but for now at least all they could do was await the traitor's next move. Bar an enlightened few, all of Paris was in denial. Less than two decades had passed since the First World War had come to a close, and France was still trying to shake off the war's long shadow. Just short of two million French soldiers and civilians had perished, so many more wounded. This was a city, a people, that was war-weary, that hungered for entertainment, for laughter and for light. To that end, a short drive from the Deuxième Bureau's Paris headquarters, one of the city's most celebrated entertainers was giving Parisians and foreign visitors alike exactly what they hungered for, and as almost no other female performer seemed able to do. At her own nightclub, Shea Josephine, the distinctive figure of Josephine Baker, Superstar stepped into the limelight, or rather the muted intimate lighting that conjured up just the kind of cozy magical feel that such a venue required. American by birth, in part a descendant of slaves, Josephine had been brought up in grinding poverty, and it was in France and chiefly Paris that she had first found fame and fortune. As a result, she loved the city and its people with all her heart and soul. Her nightly performances at Chez Josephine embodied all of that. 
she gave to her guests all that she had, somehow making each and every one of them feel special, as if she were dancing and singing and glittering and captivating, especially for him or for her. The ability to reach out and embrace and touch our audiences was one of the most unique and potent assets. One of the other things that distinguished her, and indeed her club, was her runaway love of animals. One of the signatures of her act was the exotic four-legged cast who joined her on stage. Josephine herself appeared like the most beautiful panther, as the famous French novelist Sidonie Gabrielle Collette would describe her. Several of Josephine's menagerie had taken up residence in her club, which gave it a distinctive Dr. Doolittle-esque air as Tutut the goat and Albert the pig cavorted with the guests. But of course, if a goat and pig could take to the floor, what excuse did the human clientele have not to let their hair down and dance? The moment that Josephine breezed into Chez Josephine, more often than not at one o'clock in the morning, having already performed an evening show at one of Paris's top theaters, the atmosphere was transformed. She would step between the tables, pulling beards and patting bald heads and everywhere making light and laughter before dousing Albert with a few squirts of Je Reviens perfume by Worth. As she did so, it became obvious that her greatest talent wasn't her voice, though it was captivating, or her svelte, lissome form, though she could dance like almost no one else seemed able. It was her sheer strength of personality and her ability to relate, to forge connections. Her very presence made a world menaced by war seem a better, brighter, more joyful place. And in the intimate environment of her club, she could truly sparkle. Stepping onto the dance floor, she would begin to twirl and gyrate to the beat of the jazz, improvising her steps seemingly without thinking, almost subconsciously as the rhythm found its pace and its place in her soul. She could do so endlessly for hours, hypnotically, never seeming to tire. But eventually, realizing she was dancing mostly alone, she would drag the remainder of her guests out into the limelight. Soon the entire establishment would be rocking with the beat as the good times rolled. I want people to shake off their worries the way a dog shakes off his fleas, declared Josephine of her, her club. I never amused myself more. I made jokes. Everyone did the Charleston, the boys, the maitre de hotel, the cook, the cashier, the errand boys, the goat and the pig all in the midst of streamers, balls, and all night the lights kept changing. <laughs> A reviewer from the French magazine Le Soir would paint an enchanting picture of Chez Josephine, midnight, naked shoulders, blue chandelier throwing a soft light to the slow dying of the jazz, a world exhausted, Suddenly a shiver goes through the sold out room. Josephine Baker has just made her entrance. Simple, quick, amiable. She slides between the tables. Joy, absent until now, has returned. She dances, then suddenly remembers she is the owner. She forces a customer to dance with her until everybody is on the dance floor. By anyone's reckoning, Josephine had succeeded in her aim. She had taught Paris to enjoy itself again and to rediscover its heart. The people loved her for it, or at least mostly they did. By her own account, she had left the land of her birth, America, due to the segregation and the Jim Crow laws that it meant she really could not make it as a performer there. By contrast, Paris, all of Europe had embraced her. She had found it remarkably free of prejudice, a promised land in which she could be all she had dreamed she might be and more. 
From time to time, the unwelcome sentiments of her youth and her teenage years had come to back to haunt her, even there. A few years back, she had been invited to announce that a 27-year-old American called Charles Lindbergh had made the first solo transatlantic flight, landing his aircraft, the Spirit of St. Louis, at the nearby Paris Le Boucher airfield. Of course, Josephine was overjoyed and she felt hugely honored. Not only was she American by birth, but she hailed from the city of St. Louis, after which Lindbergh had named his aircraft. As she knew full well, people both sides of the Atlantic were transfixed by Lindbergh's incredible exploits, which had monopolized headlines. She was performing that evening at the Folies Berger, a Paris music hall which then was the most famous and lavish in the world. Good news, ladies and gentlemen, she announced, pausing theatrically to make the announcement. Charles Lindbergh has arrived. The news caused such an outpouring of joy and wonder that it almost but not quite stopped the show. Later, she and fellow revelers retired to a chic Paris restaurant, La Bille de Telemé, the motto of which fittingly was, do what you will. The place was awash with joviality as figures toasted Lindbergh's success. But then an American seated with his wife at a nearby table was heard to say loudly, at home, an N-word woman belongs in the kitchen. A stunned and horrified hush settled over the room. The restaurant manager went to investigate. The American repeated the remark. You are in France, the manager told him. And here we treat all races the same. Still, Josephine was mortified. It was a painful reminder of all that she had fled from, finding in Europe a kind of sanctuary and freedom that she had never mentioned, dreamed possible. Let, yet a little over a decade later, with the relentless rise of Nazi Germany, all of that, all that she held dear, and all that she cherished seemed to be falling into shadow and more. We shall skip the story about the traitor and return to our Josephine. As Berlin cranked out the propaganda, so the enemies of the Nazi state began to be targeted. Josephine Baker was one. She would find herself the subject of Goebbels' personal vitriol. In 1937, a new and groundbreaking show, show, En Super Volie, had opened in Paris with the express aim of promoting the city's upcoming exposition Internationale des Arts et Techniques dans la Vie Moderne, a six-month-long festival showcasing global art, culture, and technology. Among others, there would be a British pavilion, a Spanish pavilion, a Soviet, Soviet, Soviet pavilion, and of course, a German one. The headline performer of En Super Voli, which was designed as a prelude to the exposition, was Josephine Baker. But now she had starred in two movies, for the first of which, Siren of the Tropics, she'd been signed up aged just 21. She had also, she'd also performed Le Criole, a comic opera by the German-born French composer Jacques Offenbach. Her star was at her zenith, and the producers of En Super Voli commissioned a giant painted frieze to publicize the show, depicting Josephine draped in jewels and feathers, drinking a toast with a top-hatted gentleman. The exposition was defined by a global theme, and the show echoed that. It opened with a series of distinct routines, each set in contrasting regions of the world. One, La Jungle Maveuse, was set in the jungle complete with a massive stage elephant. Another was set in the snowy wastes of the North Pole, with Josephine cast as the queen of the far north. 
complete with sled and huskies. A third was set firmly in Africa from where Josephine's ancestors would have hailed. Josephine's dear friend, the acclaimed writer Colette, was there to see one of the earliest performances. We love her assured, penetrating, emotional voice, and we do not tire of the gentleness that affecting desire to please, Colette wrote. But she was most struck by the African Josephine, covered by a white woolen oriental cape and swathed in veils, the stage bedecked in colors both fiery and pale blue, the delightful entrance to the Udayas garden in Rabat. Her eyes huge, outlined in black and blue, gaze forth, the cheeks are flushed, the most dazzling and moist sweetness of her teeth shows beneath her dark and violet lips. As Colette's review foreshadowed, Josephine's performance in En Super Jolie was a sensation, but not with everyone. As the Grand Pavillon rose above the Paris skyline, many built in stark modernist style, that of Nazi Germany seemed the biggest and the brashest, dwarfing Great Britain's. Its design by Hitler's architect, Albert Speer, sought to embody the power and potency of the new Germany. Above the pavilion thrust a rank of flagpoles on each of which flew the signature emblem of the Nazi state, one co-opted from ancient history, the swastika. It was a grim portent of what was to come. Chapter two starts with an honorable spy. The effort continues to set up shop as far as the espionage system in Paris. And so I'm going to read just toward the end of that. As Josephine had declared in her 1927 memoir, penned with French writer Marcel Sauvage, she abhorred the stereotyping of women and she cherished her freedoms. But since then, a far greater challenge, a far greater menace, had raised its ugly head. In 1926, she had left Paris to tour Europe, her itinerary taking her finally to Berlin. Not yet a decade after the horrors of the First World War, there was a wild exuberance to Germany's capital city, and the bright, brash nightlife felt more like the America she had known in her youth, Harlem, or the Chestnut Alley district of her native St. Louis than it did the refined airs of a historic capital of Europe. This was Germany prior to the rise of Nazism, and there was a hectic decadence about the city, a need to haunt for sensation and thrills, and an antidote to the horrors of the Great War. Not only had Germany suffered during that conflict, but this was the nation of the vanquished, and there was a need to party and forget. Raised in dire poverty in the city of St. Louis, Josephine often had no uniform or even shoes to wear to school. Teased, rejected, mocked, she had played the fool and had mostly hated school. She was far happier leading her street gang stealing coal from locomotives to sell to rich white folks. She had proved the fearless and the wild one, climbing onto the rail cars to throw down handfuls of the dirty black rock so the rest could stuff their sacks full. Unsurprisingly, she thrilled to the wild excess of Berlin in 1926, fearful that her stardom and good fortune might prove transitory, that she might sink back into the abject penury and hard grind of her youth. She chased fame and fortune relentlessly, let it lest it slip away. She also unashamedly rewrote and recast her origins, her parentage especially. I don't lie, I improve on my life. <laughs> she once told a reporter who had commented pointedly on the contradictory versions of her family history that she had told. During her first Berlin tour, Josephine's performance at La Revue Negre 
The show that had brought her from New York to Paris in 1925 proved a sellout hit. In Germany, the concept of the novel savage, supposedly a more primitive and natural form of human existence, one that predated modern mechanized existence, was all the rage. Josephine's headline act of La Revue Negre was soon to embody all of that. Her near naked dances, she believed she was born to move, rhythm high, hardwired into her soul, captivating audience just as the not culture nudist movement was taking Germany by storm. But at the same time, there was an extreme right wing ideology starting to hold, take hold, which aimed to purge the country of such immorality and to build a nation that was healthy, fit, and strong. This was the nascent Nazi movement. And its stormtroopers at the time were the so-called brown shirts. They condemned Josephine Baker and her shows vociferously. In their warped mindset, she was not only a symbol of the decadence they abhorred, she also epitomized the racial impurity they despised. With the brown shirts then viewed largely as a lunatic fringe, Josephine proved more than able to counter their criticism. I'm not immoral, she objected pithily. I'm only natural. With most of Germany, her tour had gone down a storm. With the brown shirts then viewed largely as a lunatic fringe, um, but when she returned two years later, it would prove a very different story. Long before she got there, her detractors were ready. She traveled first to Austria, only to be greeted with screaming headlines. She was the Black Devil and Jezebel, the biblical female pariah and false prophet. Armed guards had to escort her through Vienna as leaflets decried the brazen-faced heathen dances she would perform. With many Austrians embracing the proposed union with Germany, Hitler's rantings of Mein Kampf, including that black people were inferior half-apes, had found a ready readership. The very worst coined the phrase Negersmach to greet Miss Baker, meaning that her performance and her very existence were an insult to the Nazi cause, and especially that of breeding the so-called Ubermenschen, the much vaunted Aryan master race. By the time Josephine's show opened in Theater de Dresden, one of Berlin's most famous opera houses, the agitators were there in force, drowning her out with hoots and catcalls, a review the following day in a pro-Nazi paper screamed, how dare they put our beautiful blonde Leah Seidel with a negress on the stage. Leah Seidel, an, an Austrian actress, had actually befriended Josephine and was mortified at how she was being treated. The show was scheduled to run for six months. It lasted three weeks before Josephine, haunted, harangued, abused, was forced to flee. Moving on to Dresden, the press decried the revulsions of this colored girl. In Munich, Josephine faced even worse. She was banned outright for her performances would offend the city's sense of self-respect. She was warned. She faced mobs who seemed to hate her and she sensed that they would like to see an end to her life. In truth, her instincts, her palpable sense of the threat, were far from overblown. Her Berlin tour had been booked by the Rotter brothers, who happened to be Jewish. Facing vitriolic criticism and denigration, they would be forced to flee to Czechoslovakia, leaving behind them the foremost Berlin theaters that they had run. Even there, they were still not safe from the long arm of the Nazi state. Tracked by the Gestapo, the Rotter brothers would be hunted down, arrested, and murdered. After the shock of that tour, Josephine kept her distance from Germany and those other nations following under, following, falling under Hitler's sway, even as the dark horrors of Nazism suddenly grew clearer for all to see. 
On 9 November 1938, in the terror that foreshadowed the Holocaust, crystal knocked the night of broken glass, convulsed Austria and Germany. Jews were dragged from their homes and synagogues were put to the torch as men, women, and children were clubbed to death. Of course, by then, Josephine was married to the wealthy Jewish industrious, industrialist Jean Lyon, so she felt his horror most personally. As nothing else, Crystal knocked crystallized her abhorrence of Hitler and all that he stood for. Ironically, this was the year that Josephine's existence would come to Hitler's attention most personally. Visiting Austria following the Anschluss, the takeover of that nation by Nazi Germany, the Führer chose to commandeer Vienna's historic Weinsinger Hotel. Typically, he took the best suite for himself, having failed to notice before retiring to bed that none other than Josephine Baker's portrait was gazing down at him from the wall. Needless to say, he was not most pleased. By the time Jacques Apti had come calling at Le Beauchene, Josephine was acutely aware, acutely aware of the need to stand up to bullies like Hitler and all he espoused. Nazi Germany's actions were criminal, she would write, and criminals had to be punished. As war engulfed Europe, she would declare herself willing to kill Nazis with her own hand, if need arose. Of course, her recruitment as an honorable correspondent on the espionage team gave her the means to strike back without necessarily ever needing to draw blood. Josephine would become emblematic of many things as Gérard Le Tang of the Service Historique de la Défense, the Defense Historical Services of the French military would declare, quote, of the engagement of women during the Second World War, of the engagement of foreigners in the French resistance. In truth, the coming conflict would bring her face to face with herself. As she refused defeat, requiring her to master the greatest performance of her life in which her very survival would hang in the balance. But first, she would have to prove herself in the cut and thrust of espionage. And we shall stop there on page 35 of 397 pages. You can see that I would like to read more just from the fact of how many post-its I've marked on this book. It becomes unbelievable how daring and confident and determined and full of Jean de Joie de Vivre, actually, she becomes in this book, it just it, it turns the whole story of Josephine Baker upside down for most people who know her as a great performer. I have 35 pages left, so I can't tell you how it ends, even if I wanted to, but that's exactly what I'm going to do as soon as I hang up here, <laughs> is read the final 35 pages. We have come past the great landing uh, in North Africa, um, and so I'm sure we're moving across North Africa, starting with Algiers. Anyway, it's a great book from my vantage point. I enjoyed it immensely. Um, and if it attracted your attention, I hope you'll read it. I'm the first to take the book out. Uh, so that's quite a privilege, actually. And it is not from even our own library, although I know we have one, but uh, it is from the Wells Public Library. So thank you, Wells Public Library, for adding this to your shelves so quickly. I would like to tell you a little bit about next week's book, just so you can circle your calendar. Next week's book, you are going to do a salute to History Month at the Captain Public Library. The uh, number of books on history, American history particularly, 
are enormous, as one might guess. Uh, and so I wanted to find a book that was a, a little bit different and a, a different story than we might think about, you know, the Revolutionary War or whatever. Um, and I selected a book that takes place on the East Coast in actions that we normally think of took place west of the Mississippi or in upstate New York. The name of the book is called Covered with Night, a story of murder and indigenous justice in early America. It is written by Nicole Eustace, and it is the winner of the 2022 Pulitzer Prize in history. It's the winner also of the Francis Parkman Prize, Society of American Historians, finalist for the National Book Award for Nonfiction, Best Books of the Year by Time, Smithsonian, Boston Globe, and Kirkus Reviews. This Pulitzer Prize winning history that transforms a single event in 1722 into an unparalleled portrait of early America. Taking its title from a Haldenosani metaphor for mourning, covered with night, ultimately urges us to consider indigenous approaches to grief and condolence, rupture and repair, as we seek new avenues of justice in our own era. It's quite a remarkable story. I hope you'll join me for it. Covered with Night by um, Nicole Eustace. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you appreciated and enjoyed some of the information about Josephine Baker. Uh, what an individual, what in every way, from performance on stage to performance in back alleys of Barcelona during the time of the espionage spree there. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed it. I certainly did. If you did enjoy it, please uh, press the thumbs up. You know, that's always a good vote for us. Or consider sharing it uh, with a friend. Also, feel free to leave a comment, either about uh, the story at hand or the book, the author, uh, or maybe a book of your own that you like and would be your favorite book uh, that you'd like us to consider for coming months. Also, I encourage you to subscribe to the Camden Public Library's Programs Department YouTube channel to stay on top of all of their great content. We are happy again to announce that we are still in first place of all of the libraries within the state of Maine, including the major cities of Maine, as the single library in the limelight with the most subscribers on a YouTube channel for library programs. So if you've not subscribed before, please do it just so we stay on top a little Christmas. It'd be a great thing to celebrate Christmas. <laughs> Thank you so very much. I hope you have a good week ahead. And above all, stop and smell the roses, as they say. Stop and look at the harbor. Stop and look at the beautiful leaves. Take the time to hug a tree <laughs> and take care of yourself. Thank you. Goodbye.